My name is Ali. I'm a doctor and YouTuber. I'm Taymor. I'm a data scientist and writer. And you're listening to Not Overthinking, the weekly podcast where we think about happiness, creativity, and the human condition. Hello, and welcome to Not Overthinking. Taymor, how are you doing on this fine day? I'm actually doing great. I think it's been a pretty solid week. We've had a... Uh... Yeah, a lot's happened this week. I finished an audiobook, which is really good, and we're going to be talking about that during the episode. I got a sofa for my room that arrived this week. Oh, how is it? I really like it. Yeah. I've I've noticed that yeah, sometimes if I'm, you know, trying to get some work done, I just won't be in the mood on my desk. But when I relocate to the sofa or the bed, then suddenly like it's a change of energy and I'm like, yeah, this is actually much better. Where it's just like being being on the desk and like I'm sometimes not in the mood for that. So like just moving across the room <laughs> somehow works. Um, yeah, but yeah, the sofa's good. We'll, we'll soon be filming uh, the podcast on the sofa. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I used to get some art for the wall above it. I've ordered um I've ordered a painting. Well, a print of a painting, um, by my uh, my favorite painter, Edward Munch. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, so that'll be arriving and I might get a couple more of those um, yeah so far so far is uh, really nice what else has happened this week yeah the audiobook um, I think things things at causal are, are looking pretty good we closed a, a nice big customer this week um, oh. so that's nice can you talk more about yeah. that or are you not allowed to yeah sure um, the company in London they're about 100 people um, yeah uh, paying us $500 a month which is you know not a not a huge amount but I think like it's it's a good price point for us and more crucially it's uh it feels more repeatable because plenty of other companies of 100 roughly 100 people in size will have similar problems and stuff um and so you know if these guys are getting a lot of value out of it and they seem to be then we should be able to get more more people like that and I think the I think the struggle so far has always kind of been finding the right market um, you know, like there's kind of two, there's, there's like two aspects to, you know, building a successful product. There's like, does your product solve, you know, some problems and does it solve those problems for the right people, i.e. a market? And, you know, we, we think our product solves a bunch of problems. I think so far we've kind of struggled to get a foothold in a, in a good market where lots of people care about these problems and are willing to pay to solve these problems. Um, but I think I think this sort of uh, customer profile could be really good. So, you know, companies that are a hundred-ish people um, doing I don't know a few million in revenue, um, where they have a finance person who you know cares about making their lives easier. Uh, and so, yeah, hopefully this will be a turning point. Um, yeah, feedback seems promising from the other similar companies we've been demoing to. So I think I think this could be the market for us. I think this could be it. Nice. That's quite exciting. Yeah, it's really cool. How's your week been? It's been pretty good. Uh, the The downer in my week has been the fact that I've had a sty <coughs> on top of my eye, which is like this a cyst that's somewhat infected. And so for the last three days, I've had like, you know, this like painful swelling above my right eye that kind of keeps my eye half closed. Whoa. And that oh, I yeah, it's to, looking like, kind of messed Sheen's up. Been, Sheen's been making me cups of black tea that I dip a t-shirt into and then put on my eye because apparently black tea has a antibacterial properties and b the warm water helps reduce the swelling somehow wait how do you get and this thing i don't know it's it's like yeah it's like pink some, eye. some sort of infection so that's that's been going on and i i was actually using your causal branded t-shirt yesterday to soak my eye with and i was oh, thinking yeah, about I mean, you at, at the at the time so i hope you <laughs> What a great use of uh, the causal brand. <laughs> yeah, man. Causal be out here saving lives. As they <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. Before we get into the actual episode, there were a couple of other things that came up this week. I think I made a okay. note of one of them in my uh, in my second brain in room. Before we get into that, this episode is brought to you by none other than Skillshare. Yes, that is right. Skillshare is again sponsoring us for hopefully the entirety of 2021 because lots of you guys have been going over to Skillshare.com forward slash not overthinking pod to take your free trial of Skillshare. If you haven't heard by now, and you probably should have done, Skillshare is like Netflix for online courses. Like they've got thousands of classes covering all sorts of disciplines from productivity and cooking to interior design and illustration and art. I've got I think seven classes on Skillshare at this point, two productivity classes, 
too about how to study for exams i've even got a cooking class which objectively isn't very good but like you know it's it's kind of funny to watch uh, i think the productivity and the studying classes are very good so you should head over to skillshare.com forward slash not overthinking pod and the first 1000 people to hit that link will get the skillshare free trial that'll also be linked in the show notes if you want to just kind of tap on it and sign up and it also really helps support the podcast so thank you skillshare for sponsoring this episode awesome a big thanks to to skillshare so there was one small thing which i Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the main big thing was that this week in our company social, we decided to play some four-player chess. Have you ever played four-player chess? No, I have not, but is that the one where you capture a piece and then it goes to the other person? No, no, no. That That's a different kind of four-player chess. That's called um, Bug House. But this is just like a four-player chess variant on chess.com where essentially, like, you know how in a, in a normal chess board, like, opposite sides of the board have pieces on them, right? And this, like, four sides of the chessboard have pieces on them, and each person, like, takes a side. And you, you kind of play it in pairs, so you and the person opposite you are on a team, and then the other person mm. and the person opposite them are on a team. And it's just, like, so much fun. It's, like, so it's so much better than normal chess. And I think the best part is being good at normal chess does not really help you at all. <laughs> like, none of, the, okay. none of the tactics, none of the strategies, none of the, like, <laughs> things that you're used to doing are very helpful in the slightest. It really is about kind of coordination and kind of ganging up on one of the other team <laughs> with with both of your teammates. Um, yeah, it's just like a ton of fun. So yeah, we played that at the company social. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I think it was a big hit. Uh, I, I'd highly recommend it. So do you do you communicate with your partner throughout or what? Yeah, yeah I mean, we is did it, it on like a video call. Roll? And like okay. on the on chess.com, you can also sort of draw arrows on the screen that only your partner can see. So if you're like okay. planning an attack, you can sort of uh, secretly communicate that way um but yeah it's just it's just a ton of fun and like you just you basically just need to know the rules of chess to kind of be okay at it like you know having played lots of chess doesn't actually help uh so i think like it's a nice sort of even playing field and yeah it's just like it's just fun i think like doing anything as a team is like automatically more fun than doing it solo right it's like that okay so there's four of you in the company then <laughs> uh well, it was three of us plus our friend Mac, who's a, you know, a friend and longtime supporter of Causal and this podcast. Uh, okay, uh, so do you, do you have company socials once a week? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we're on on the verge of hiring a new writer and potentially bringing on another editor as well. And so I'm thinking, should we have company socials like once a week? Yeah, dude. Is of it? course. Yeah. Because like you don't what see is... each other in real life, right? No. Yeah, I, I imagine like for the other people, it's probably, I mean, if you imagine it from their point of view, they're kind of sitting in a room all day working remotely with this random guy across, you know, on the internet with other random people on the internet. I think there's definitely something lost to not having the kind of social interaction with colleagues and things. Okay. So yeah. what, does it, what does it look like? Is it like well, once a week on a Wednesday night, you'd log on to chess.com at 7 p.m. time? type. Yeah, we have a recurring calendar event once a week on a Wednesday night and yeah we kind of decide oh do you want to play some chess or some Tetris or some League of Legends or whatever and then yeah we just just vibe man we just straight vibe okay that's interesting I might do that Wednesday night um, people can order a takeaway on the company if they would like and then just chat or play some chess or whatever yeah I think playing look I, I think the whole just chat thing I don't know yeah I'm it would, it would feel the the just chat thing would feel very artificial i think yeah yeah it's like okay kids let's have some fun <laughs> you know yeah. whereas i think you know if, if you're playing chess or tetris you're going to be chatting as well but you know it just sort of keeps uh keeps half of your mind occupied which is what you want really mm. okay yeah four player chess game changer sick right um anything else we need to preamble about before we get into the meat of the podcast um, I think that's all good. Oh yeah, today, today in a few hours' time, we have our first not overthinking member Zoom call, uh, so that'll be fun. We have a nice Slack group going, uh, about sixty people at the moment. Again, I'm hoping to expand soon. Um, but yeah, one of the big things that everyone said was that it would be cool to do uh, Zoom calls of various formats. And in today's Zoom call, we're uh, yeah, I think one for one format which is quite good is kind of carving out time for things that are important but not urgent. And so in this uh, in this Zoom call, we're going to all be doing a weekly review 
of our weeks and kind of talking about that and uh, yeah I guess as the productivity guru Ali you'll be guiding that session oh gosh okay sure I can give it a go I have uh, tried weekly reviews many times over the last several years and I've done them I've done them about eight times in total really <laughs> so I thought the weekly review is like <laughs> the linchpin of is. the productivity system <laughs> It, it really is like it's like one of the most important things you can be doing it's just that who's got time to do a weekly review man <laughs> <Come on. laughs> yeah there's this like there's this really funny um cartoon of uh it's it's kind of like of some cavemen people who are pushing uh who are pushing a wheelbarrow with square wheels <laughs> and then there's a guy with circular wheels behind them like trying to offer them the circular wheels and they're like no man we don't have time for that <laughs> we're too busy <laughs> Like obviously the circular wheels will make them faster. <laughs> and then there's this other there's this other phrase which I really love, which is something along the lines of, uh, you 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 can waste a year as if you're not happy to waste a few hours or something. Yeah, you know, there's some, something to that effect. You, know, mm. you can waste a lot of time if uh, you're not willing to waste a little bit of time, like focusing on important things that aren't urgent. Yeah, there's uh, the the one that I like is uh, weeks of work saves hours of planning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Yeah. I tweeted I, tw I tweeted that and I was dismayed by the amount of replies being like isn't it supposed to be the other way around oh, and then man. the amount of people replying to those people being like that's the point mate and it was it was it was quite it's quite it's quite wholesome that's nice I see you have a great community going on on your twitter.com on on the twitter yeah exactly all right cool enough uh enough chit chat let's get to it so I recently finished a book called the tyranny of merit oh <laughs> Sounds fantastic. The, the tagline is, what's become of the common good? All right, so look, I listened to this as an audio book and I made lots of, uh, on Audible, there's a feature where you can save clips. I made lots of clips on Audible. We've never really tried this before, but I'm gonna kind of go through those and then try and find the corresponding passages in the Kindle version. So can't I mean- you just play the, Can you just play yeah. the Audible clips through your microphone? I can, but like, I, I haven't got much context on it. Like when you read a Kindle, when you look at a Kindle highlight, you can sort of glance at it and see what it's about. With an audio highlight, you have no idea what it's about. Like you're just gonna play a clip, try and remember the context and stuff like that. So I think like, there just, there definitely needs to be a better way of kind of making notes from audio content. Uh, I use I use a podcast app called Air, Air Audio, uh, which lets you like triple tap your uh, professional AirPods. And then it makes a clip of the past 15 seconds. Uh, Audible has a feature that lets you take clips, but again, like you can't scan an audio clip. So hopefully it'll be weird for the two of us because there'll be lots of silences where I'm like playing a clip and reading something, but we'll cut out those, those silences in post. And so hopefully for the listeners, it should uh, be a very free flowing, <laughs> you know, one after the other kind of uh, discussion. So let's see how it goes. So I think, um, yeah, the, the book is broadly kind of taking a look at this idea of meritocracy. I think meritocracy is sort of one of the big invisible ideas that underpins, you know, it, it's it's sort of like a an implicit assumption in, in yeah, all sorts of things in society. If you listen to how politicians talk about things, it's very much uh, through this angle of meritocracy where, uh, you know, if you work hard and do the right things, you can succeed, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think this has mainly kind of come about in the past, you know, hundred or so years uh, and the book kind of take look it kind of looks at the history of this idea of meritocracy um, and also kind of takes a sort of philosophical view of like is this legit like wh where does this fall where does this idea fall down and things Hold like on, that sorry I need to um, stop you there because my professional airpods max are not playing any audio and I'm not sure if it's a problem on my end or a problem on yours but I'm going to take them off Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Someone really needs to invent a a better way of taking notes from audiobooks, and also some Bluetooth headphones that actually just work reliably. But sorry, you were saying um, meritocracy. 
yeah so the book is yeah. broadly about you know this concept of meritocracy that kind of uh is pervasive everywhere you look um and i, th I yeah i think it, this idea of meritocracy is a really important one to look into because it's just kind of assumed you know it, it's one of the sort of invisible narratives that sort of uh shape modern times i suppose and i never really i mean i, I sort of actually I, I sort of thought about this stuff and i always found it a little bit pro problematic um and actually i've i've always felt that praise is actually problematic i don't think we've talked about that on the podcast but i i'm a, i'm a strong believer in praise being problematic and in the dominican republic we had like a long discussion about this which concluded in everyone calling me an idiot i don't i, I don't think i was very convincing about why praise is problematic but i think this um at its core this idea of meritocracy is why i think uh, praise is problematic um but okay uh so i think uh that Yeah, a lot of the book is centered around uh, higher education. So uh, the concept of higher education, and this is the way pol politicians talk about it and stuff as well, is that it's a way for anyone, regardless of, you know, your lot in life to kind of get ahead, you know, even if you're born, uh, you know, without any special advantages, by working hard and, you know, doing well on tests and going to a good college, that is like the route to uh, a good life. That's a route to success and, and, and all of that kind of business. And a bunch of stuff has happened in, in the past few years that kind of peels back the curtain a little bit. In 2019, there was this big scandal around um, in the US around parents paying for their kids to basically cheat to get into uh, good universities like Yale and Stanford and stuff like that. Do you remember this, Ali? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, parents can sort of I mean, there's like a back, there's, there's a, I mean, what's called like a, the back door and then what's called the side door. Uh, I think this, the side door is what a lot of people try and do, which is, uh, you know, pay a bunch of money for like tutoring for, to do really well on the standardized tests and, you know, pay a bunch of money for your kid to go off on like a traveling the world kind of summer so that they have something to write about in their, uh, in their personal essay or whatever. Uh, and then there's the back door, which is like straight, straight up cheating. <laughs> and so <laughs> a lot of people were found to do, be doing the sort of straight up cheating thing where that, like some, someone will, you know, fake a bunch of stuff to pretend like your kid is on the lacrosse, you know, on the lacrosse team or, or something like that. You know, this, this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's completely insane. But yeah, there was this big scandal. Um, and I think broadly like trust in, in higher education is on, on the decline particularly as a result of the internet and things like that. And especially because of coronavirus and everything going online, like the, yeah, I, th I think like the amount of faith people have in universities and higher education uh, is really, really dwindling. And historically higher education has kind of been this, uh, you know, this bastion of meritocracy where um, it, it represents this idea that no matter who you are, you can kind of get ahead, you can succeed all this kind of business. Uh, and so a lot of the um, book is sort of, yeah, it, it takes a look as higher, at higher education as an example of like uh, what might be a little bit wrong with this. Yeah, this re this reminds me a lot of one of my favorite podcast episodes of all time, which you and I actually listened to when we were on our Scotland road trip, called the the myth of the 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 meritocracy myth, which is on Ezra Klein's podcast where he talks to this Yale law professor who like feels strongly that this whole meritocracy thing is a total myth. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's really, really eye opening because it, it, it goes counter to a lot of the intuitions that we just, just hold without, without even questioning. And even anytime I've tried to think about this, I have always run into a, oh my God, this just <laughs> like, where do you even begin? <laughs> yeah. Like all of our, basically all of society is built around to an extent this idea of meritocracy this idea of kind of just desserts that you get what you work for type vibes and yeah. it's just it's just so problematic <laughs> yeah exactly um yeah this book basically tries to expand on that a little bit <laughs> <clears throat> i think this the starting point for all of this needs to be like you know what is the role of people in society like what is this uh what is this society business about mm. i think the author of this book thinks the society business is about uh you know human flourishing and the common good um 
yeah, the common good being like, you know, we should encourage things in society that kind of benefit everyone. Uh, and that's kind of almost like the goal. Uh, and we and we want to promote human flourishing. So, you know, we want to have a society where everyone can flourish. I won't go too much into the details of like, I mean, I don't have a good definition for this. He doesn't actually present a good definition for this, but I think, I think whatever your definition of human flourishing is, it actually doesn't really matter to uh, most of this guy's um, argument. Um, but yeah, human flourishing and the common good are the things that we want to promote in society. And I guess the question is like, does meritocracy actually do that? Um, the the other sort of recent event, events rather, that he talks a lot about are first Brexit and second uh, you know, Trump being president of the United States. And he thinks that both of these things are a result, are, are sort of like an inevitable result of these meritocratic ideals where... Um, you know, if you look at the people who voted for Trump and who voted for Brexit, uh, you know, if they hadn't, go, you know, if you hadn't gone to university or something like that, I can't remember the exact stat that he gives. Um, you know, there's like a 70% chance you'll, you'll like vote for Trump or vote for Brexit or, or something. And if you had gone to university, it's like significantly lower or something. So like th th this sort of university thing, you know, really seems to have split the country, the country being the UK or the US, and I'm sure it applies to other countries as well. To split the country in two and you know there are these narratives about like oh you know these people who vote for trump they're just like racist or whatever um maybe these people who vote for brexit are just like racist or whatever and he kind of says that yeah sure that you know racism is a part of it but if you if you only look at it through the lens of racism you kind of miss out this completely um sort of separate thing which is that large swaths of the population don't no longer are no longer given any social esteem uh, and so he talks about this idea of social esteem quite a lot which is you know linked to the idea of like everyone having some amount of dignity and social status and stuff like that and basically if you haven't gone to university um you know, because because of like all this meritocracy stuff you know that that is just kind of assumed you know if, if you've gone to university especially a good university you know you've you know in sort of prestigious careers and stuff you're doing all right, you get social esteem, people think you're a productive member of society. If you haven't gone to university, you don't get any social esteem and you're kind of, it just kind of feels bad basically, right? And so you have like a ton of people who sort of feel forgotten. And and like, yeah, he also talks about how the elites, i.e. people who went to university, good universities and stuff like that. There's just like so much casual shitting on people who didn't, um, you know, in the US, there's a there's a term called the flyover states, which are like all the states kind of in the middle, <laughs> which are right. Yeah, I, I guess the I guess the the implication is that they're just like kind of irrelevant. They're, they're the states that you fly over to get to, <laughs> I don't know, New York or San Francisco or whatever the relevant cities are, right? Um, and you know, the phrases like trailer trash and all of this kind of stuff, and like there, there's just like so much shitting on people who didn't go, basically didn't go to university. Um, and that that's kind of the double-edged sword of of meritocracy which he digs into which is that yeah it's it's great if you're doing well but you know the, the it's kind of implied that if you're not doing well then that's kind of on you um for not you know not having done the right things or whatever and this is all very much linked to like uh yeah it's like sort of morality you know like if you're you know partly this idea of meritocracy is that like if you, if you do well, you kind of deserve it and it's sort of like morally justified. And so if you if you don't do well by the traditional metrics or whatever, that that is also morally justified and, you know. Uh, okay, so that's like a, a bunch of me rambling. Let me let me get to some of these clips. So I think the first um, the first couple of chapters are kind of about the, the history of this stuff. Like where does this idea um, kind of come from of, you know, if you do the right things, you are you are a good person kind of thing. All right, so he starts off by basically saying, look, this idea of meritocracy, it's, it's certainly not crazy, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with hiring people based on merits. Uh, it's generally, like, the right thing to do. If you need a plumber to fix your toilet, you try and find the best plumber for the job, right? Um, like, you, you want someone well-qualified who can, who can do a good job. Um, and so, like, it, it makes sense as an idea, for sure. And more than that, it also, you know, it seems kind of fair, right? Like, rewarding people based on their merits doesn't discriminate on any kind of arbitrary basis it's sort of, it just discriminates on on the basis of like achievement like how good you are at this thing uh and so you know on the face of it 
this idea of merit it seems fair it, it kind of makes sense in a lot of contexts um and it also sort of it's also a nice idea like you know this idea of getting what we deserve it kind of promotes human agency it kind of you know makes us feel like oh we're in control of things all of this kind of business so f for various reasons like it's not a crazy idea uh and he th he thinks that this idea basically traces back to uh the bible uh you know this notion that our, our fate reflects our merit uh it's sort of yeah just deeply held in what well, he says are the moral intuitions of western culture um and apparently uh, I, i'm sure some christians would disagree with this but apparently biblical theology teaches us that uh natural events happen for a reason uh you know if the weather is nice and and the harvest is bountiful then that's like god rewarding us for good behavior uh you know when when a ship encounters stormy seas people ask who who on the crew had angered god for that punishment or whatever uh, and yeah he says you know this idea of kind of god rewarding or punishing humans based on the things that they do essentially based on uh their 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 moral goodness uh this is kind of the root of um meritocracy Okay, that seems very reasonable so far, but I, I, I sense there is a big but coming. Uh, no, I think I think he's just kind of, uh, you know, give, giving a bit of a, a historical context. Um, so yeah, like on on the one hand, there are, there are plenty of ideas in religion around like God punishing you if you do bad things and God rewarding you if you do good things, and that's basically this idea of merit. Like if you are good, you will be rewarded you know kind of justly according to what you did and if you're bad you will be punished according to what you did as well it's it's sort of meritocracy in a nutshell right uh, but then that it kind of like raises the question of yeah it, it's like a it's like a maybe a weird view of god where the idea of god is that uh god is sort of spending most of his time uh responding to you know the things that humans have done like oh this person did good i'll reward them this person did bad i i uh i will punish them or whatever um and you know he's doing this based on people's merits not not, not like arbitrary punishment or anything like that um but but yeah i, I guess then in religion there's also this idea of sort of salvation you know who can be saved how are people how how can sort of uh god save us from our you know from, from the human condition or whatever like can we sort of can you earn your way into heaven or is it is it like completely up to god to decide you know basically who gets in regardless of how you live your lives like you know is, is it a matter of oh i did like 100 good deeds and 95 bad deeds in my life therefore i'm good and i'm going to heaven or is there something more arbitrary about it um and so yeah there's this question around like can we earn salvation uh or does it kind of you know does it sort of come from somewhere else and this idea of earning salvation is obviously uh you know very much in line with the meritocratic ideal of everyone getting what they deserve and if you you know if you take the opposite view of like salvation being an unearned gift like you know i can i can do my best and live a good life or whatever but ultimately it's not really in my hands whether i will be saved or not um then you know it kind of uh yeah there's makes the incentives very uh misaligned yeah the, the incentives are maybe weird yeah um and then there's you know there's a bunch of other stuff with that right like uh you know if salvation is a sort of unearned gift and you know it kind of affirms god's omnipotence and all this business uh and kind of makes god responsible for everything in the world and so god is also responsible for evil and suffering and all, all, all this kind of stuff um and that might be weird because i don't know maybe you want to think that god is just in in some sense of the word just and maybe that's weird um and so like this idea the idea of like free will kind of shifts some of the blame onto humans essentially right like oh well you know the humans are doing bad things um Okay, yeah, I guess he, he's kind of presenting this this sort of spectrum where on the one hand you have 
yeah on the one hand you have like you know hum this idea of like human agency and being able to you know earn earn your rewards and things like that and then on the other hand you have uh you know the idea of sort of general gratitude and grace and all of this kind of stuff and like you know if you if you're very much on the human agency everyone gets what they deserve kind of thing there's a lot less reason to feel gratitude in life you know because well i have this thing because i deserve it and they have that thing because they deserve it like what's there to be grateful for um and so yeah it's kind of like two different views of how you might yeah how you might see sort of religion and a bunch of people have sort of you know, land on different ends of the spectrum and yeah i think the, the idea of self-help also comes into this where in the sort of meritocratic view there's a big focus around essentially self-help whereas in the other view it's like you know you can try doing whatever you want but ultimately it's it's sort of in the hands of god and so you know folks like martin luther um in the protestant reformation was very much in the it's in the hands of god thing and he kind of felt that you know you can you can no more pray your way into heaven than you could try and buy your way into heaven uh and salvation doesn't come from you know being a self-made man in any way but this is kind of weird because it was the protestant reformation that kind of brought about the current yeah it kind of kicked off the current way that we view work as work being like a good thing and, and all this kind of business um uh, what, so what, what happened was the there? deal with the protestant Re Re protestant reformation uh i don't know too much about it i think like some folks had some beef with the catholic church and they thought some of it's not legit you know this is just like this is not what the bible teaches or something and we need oh, like okay. a, yeah basically so how what, what, what because there is that phrase the the, the protestant work ethic like what yeah, is that yeah. like where does that come from does this guy go into that at all uh yeah so all right i think we're going into too much detail here but i'll just run off this religion stuff so i think broadly the the protestants when they came about their theology sort of held that salvation was a matter of god's grace not deserve, not determined by human merit or deservingness it's not really about that and like who will be saved and who will be damned is sort of predestined you, know, you can't really affect it um, apparently some people thought that and so yeah if you kind of believe that all of this stuff is predestined then you know big question in your life is you know am i am i one of the people who is is destined to be saved am i am i one of the elect you know one of the people who who, who will be saved and like and yeah to some extent that's like the only question that matters in your life but apparently it's this question that sort of led to the what, what is called the protestant work ethic he says that since every person is called to work in a, in a vocation working intensely in that calling is a sign of salvation how does that work he hasn't really explained that i think what he's kind of saying is that the idea was that look you can't really you can't really like work your way into heaven you can't pray your way into heaven or anything like that that's all predestined but work you know work is a way to glorify god regardless and so if you believe in this stuff you you want to glorify god you know for its own sake whether or not you know you'll get anything out of it mm. um so th the point of such work is not to enjoy the wealth it produces but to um to glorify god and if you're working in in order to like lavishly then consume stuff that's that's sort of a distraction from you know the the glorifying god business and it's kind of corrupt or whatever okay. and so the protestant work ethic was kind of about you know working hard but not working hard but not really consuming too much and that sort of leads to wealth accumulation yeah i mean that's kind of useful as a sort of uh, common good narrative that the reason you're working isn't for the fruits of that labor it's for the work itself and yeah if everyone had that view then society would be great <laughs> mm. so what does all this have to do with meritocracy I think we've we 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 spent about thirty five minutes talking about history right now. Um, yeah, I think we've probably spent too long talking about history. Uh, let's just round it off. Yeah, so th this is significant because of the tension between merit and grace. Uh, like, I think the the idea of this sort of working business was 
it wasn't that like if I work more, then I will be more likely to get into heaven. But it was rather a way of knowing whether you are already among the elect, like the people who you know work to glorify God. That's like a sign of salvation, you know. Like if I'm if I'm one of the people that's like that like work works really hard to glorify God for its own sake, then you know, that might be a sign that I'm I'm going that I was already one of the elect, right? Seems a bit suspect. To, <laughs> it's it, yeah. it, it 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 seems like a semantic kind of. Yeah, look, it's it, yeah, it's, it's it seems it seems a bit suspect, and it's a very small step away from. Mm. I'm working in order to get into heaven, <laughs> right? <Yes>. Like it, <laughs> it, it's like it's like very easy to mix <laughs> mix the two up. That and is, I, that's apparently, what's that's suspicious, suspicious about it. Yeah, and apparently that's basically what happened. Like, it's it, it's it's a weird and difficult idea that like this is all predestined. I'm going to work my ass off in in life to glorify God, but it'll actually have no impact on anything right like it's a weird idea it's hard to accept that god won't take any notice of, of all the faithful work i'm doing to to glorify him uh and so i think yeah basically it's a small step from this idea uh of like oh we should work hard to glorify god to oh we should work hard to get into heaven <laughs> kind of thing and i think that's kind of where the work hard is good and means you're good and all this business i think that's where the idea kind of uh comes from okay all right so that's uh that's the history lesson so i think this guy the author is a sort of college professor for the past few decades and he says in the next chapter which is called the rhetoric of rising he says that one thing he's noticed over the past few decades are that is, is that students are becoming basically more entrenched in this idea of meritocracy like they're becoming more more convinced that um, you know the things that they get are as a result of their hard work and that they deserve them uh, whereas like a few decades ago that that narrative was less strong I thought, I thought that was weird because maybe I'm just talking about like the past few years but I, f I feel like the narrative is almost starting to head in the other direction where you know there's all these discussions about privilege and stuff like this and how actually you know it's not really that meritocratic and there's like all sorts of factors outside of our control and luck and, and, and things like that. Right. Like it feels like, it feels like we're past peak meritocracy. Yeah, that was good. That was my instinct as well. I'm not sure if it's just a function of the, the sort of social bubble that we live in and the sort of people that we follow on Twitter that has that impression, but it's certainly the impression I get as well. And I'm sure a lot of our, uh, a lot of our listeners will agree. I think especially in tech, especially in America, the whole you have to go to college to live a good life thing has really been debunked. At least that's the impression I get from Twitter. Again, I don't know. On, on Twitter, yeah. <laughs> entire, entire population. <laughs> so, yeah. And there seems to be a lot more emphasis on things like actually uh, acknowledging that the education system sucks and it's mostly a, a way of, you know, outsourcing childcare to the government therefore we should be homeschooling and therefore we should be having these homeschool pods of between four to eight people and we can bring in specialists to teach them about the things that they want to learn about because you know the whole national curriculum thing is also a myth because it was all about getting creating factory workers and now we no longer need to create factory workers and all of this stuff seems to be moving away from peak meritocracy again if twitter is anything to go by yeah yeah, okay. And so, yeah, in, in this chapter, he basically talks about how a lot of our political rhetoric is around, you know, around meritocracy. Uh, it basically started with uh, Ronald Reagan when he was president. Uh, he was sort of the first person to sort of make this this meritocratic idea a core part of, of, of like, yeah, his, his rhetoric, basically. Uh, talking about how all Americans have the right to be judged on the sole basis of individual merit and, you know, to go just as far as their dreams and hard work will take them. And he used this as an argument to sort of lower taxes because if you lower taxes, then it sort of like reduces the barriers for people to succeed because, you know, if you work really hard, you can become really successful and there's no taxes holding you back kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, like... Uh, Bill Clinton also used it as well. It's this whole idea of the American dream, 
that if you work hard and play by the rules, um, you know, you'll be given a chance to go as far as your God-given ability will take you. Um, and you know, George Bush, John McCain, Marco Rubio all kind of had the same angle. Um, but apparently with Obama, it was like way more strong than any of the previous presidents. And it was like the central theme of his presidency. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Obama like constantly talked about how, you know, higher education is about making sure that bright, motivated young people have the chance to go as far as their talents and their work ethic and their dreams can take them. Um, and he, he sort of viewed a college education as the primary vehicle of, of upward mobility, basically. Um, mm -hmm. He says, uh, now, now, as a nation, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we don't promise sequel outcomes, but we were founded on the idea that everybody should have an equal opportunity to succeed. <laughs> that's that's actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, like, yeah. A pretty good message. <laughs> no matter who you are, uh, what you look like, <laughs> uh, where you come from, <laughs> you can make it. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you're cracking, your, <laughs> cracking yourself up. <laughs> where you start should not determine where you end up. And so I'm glad that everybody wants to go to college. Uh, yeah, he's basically like big on, big on that thing. Uh, and yeah, he talks about how you know, his wife, Michelle, uh, you know, they weren't especially privileged, but higher education was kind of their route into, uh, you know, success and all this kind of business. So Obama was really big on this rhetoric of rising. And then this kind of, yeah, this kind of rhetoric of rising and this focus on higher education and stuff kind of became the big divide between, uh, I guess the republicans and the the democrats in the u.s and so like in when when it was hillary running against trump hillary's campaign was you know very much like classic rhetoric of rising type stuff you know the stuff similar stuff to what obama was saying but trump's campaign wasn't actually about that at all it wasn't it you know it wasn't about like upward mobility or believing that anyone can like rise with hard work and stuff like that um it seems like trump actually never used any such slogan during his campaign or during his presidency, um, yeah, he said things. He said like really blunt things about winners and losers and making America great again. Um, but his, yeah, the, the the vision that if he has a vision, it's it certainly doesn't seem to be anything around meritocracy. Like definitely nowhere near as focused on meritocracy as say Obama or, or Hillary would have been. And yeah, he, he then basically talks about how. Um, you know, the uh, the populist antipathy towards meritocratic elites played a big part in Trump's election, big part in, um, you know, the Brexit vote, where essentially, you know, lots lots and lots of sort of working pl class people resent meritocratic elites uh, and, you know, the professional classes who, you know, reaped all the benefits of globalization. Um, whereas, you know, if you you know, didn't do so well in the meritocratic world, then yeah, you, you sort of a little bit screwed by all of it. And it's, yeah, it's easy to kind of, you know, jump to xenophobia, racism and stuff like that. And, and yeah, that was definitely a part of it, but he says that a big part of it was the sense that those who were at the bottom of the hierarchy of merit, um, were kind of looked down upon with disdain by the other people. And, you know, this is, yeah, this is definitely true, I think. So like the, yeah, this rhetoric of rising, it's, it, you know, for for folks who have a good shot at it, it, it can seem very like optimistic and promising of like, oh yeah, I can do stuff and work hard. Um, but for those kind of at the bottom who are sort of struggling to stay afloat, this rhetoric of rising is not, it's not like a, pro it's not like a good promise. It's more of like a taunt of like, Ha, ha, screw you, you know, you kind of deserve deserve this. So to summarize what we've discussed so far, we've said meritocracy, the, this idea of meritocracy, i.e. you get what you deserve and if you work hard, then you will be salvated, salvated, uh, say <laughs> you will, you will yeah. achieve, achieve salvation. This sort of extends way back to the Bible. Then a couple hundred years, several, several hundred years ago, Protestant Reformation happened that tried to sort of say that it's not really about that, guys, but... Um, that's kind of a hard idea to get your head around and now we are all society is massively entrenched in this idea of the meritocracy um this idea that 
if you work hard, then you will succeed. And if you don't succeed, it's because you didn't work hard enough. And obviously this is somewhat problematic because there are, you know, large amounts of factors on either side of the equation. And this idea of the rhetoric of rising that again, if you work hard, you will succeed. And the only thing that's stopping you from succeeding is your lack of hard work. That is one of the stark divides between, for example, Republicans and Democrats or people who vote for Trump versus people who don't, or people who vote for Brexit versus people who don't. And it's too easy and intellectually dishonest to say that if you vote for Trump, you are a racist. And if you voted Brexit, you are a racist. Like it's so much more complicated than that. And meritocracy, this rhetoric of rising is one factor. For the record, yeah, we're not exactly. saying it's the only factor. Uh, we're saying it is one, <laughs> one factor. Yeah. And look, you know, this, if, if we then take a step back and I, I guess America is definitely one of the most sort of entrenched in this idea of meritocracy and, um, you know, by comparison, most of Europe is a bit, a lot more sort of socialist. Uh, if you, if you look at the actual facts of, of like, okay, America is super into this idea. Does it actually lead to more upward mobility? And does it actually lead to more people getting out of poverty and becoming, you know, more affluent and things like that? Uh, but if you look at the actual numbers, America fares much worse than, you know, almost every, <laughs> almost every other country, I think. Uh, yeah, so there's, you know, there's a bunch of numbers not that interesting to go into, but yeah, essentially there's, there's much less economic mobility in the United States than many other countries. Uh, you know, most of Europe, for example, you know, Dania, even, even Canada. Uh, and apparently there was a New York Times article recently that basically posed the following scenario. They said, imagine you have to make a bet. There are two 18 year olds, one in China, the other in the United States, both poor and short on prospects. You have to pick the one with the better chance at upward mobility, which would you choose? And long, not long ago, the answer would have probably been simple. You know, America, obviously, the American dream, like, promises that this, you know, poor kid can, like, work their way up to success. Um, but the answer today is very much, uh, you know, China. Like, China's risen so quickly that your chances of improving your station in life there are, you know, vastly exceed those in the United States. And so, you know, if, if it were the case that, okay, this meritocracy thing, it might have its problems, but actually it does work. And, like, for, like, tons of people... This, this meritocratic ideal does actually lead to them having a better lives and things. You know, if, if that were the case, then it's like, okay, you might put your hands up and think, all right, you know, it's not ideal, but it actually does work. And so maybe we should keep it. Um, but it, it doesn't seem like it's actually working. And so this is a real problem. Okay, so the, um, the next yeah, chapter guess, is on... I, 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 I guess that in, in, in sort of classically meritocratic societies, it is the people at the top who benefit most from the meritocracy and the rhetoric might be that actually this actually guys this merit, meritocracy thing is good because the people at the bottom can also benefit from it just as much as the people at the top but that is not what happens and the rich get richer the poor get poorer the divide widens thanks to meritocracy rather than shrinking which is sort of what the um the democrat agenda would have you believe that hey mem that meritocracy is a is is a proven good is that, is that sort of what this guy's saying? Uh, I don't think he'd say he'd use the term democratic agenda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think okay, that's kind sure. of what he's saying. <laughs> By democratic agenda, I mean Obama and, and Hillary, of which he said that, there was, that, was, that was a big, that yeah, was a big yeah, part yeah. of their campaign relative yeah. to their, their, their Republican counterparts. Yeah. Yeah, I think the next chapter is pretty interesting. It's, it's about credentialism, which uh, the author describes as the last acceptable prejudice. <laughs> I think it's Ooh. pretty good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and it's about how, like, yeah, if, if you look at what, again, the stuff politicians say is, inter is interesting because it kind of represents the stuff that people would find convincing and it kind of represents the, nar the narratives that society sort of um, subscribes to. If you, if you look at the kind of stuff that politicians talk about, uh, it's becoming increasingly around being smart, you know? Like, you know, previously it might have been around, oh, this is the right thing to do or whatever. Now it's about, this is the smart thing to do. And if you want to convince people to, you know, that something should be done, you try and convince them by saying that it's the smart thing to do. And uh, this concept of, you know, smartness, intelligence or whatever, 
um, again, very much linked to sort of the uh, the worship of credentials and higher education and um, and all this kind of business. Uh, so I think Trump didn't have a great academic record. Um, and at, I think at various points he he tried to <laughs> he tried to like make it seem like Obama did, didn't have a good academic record as well. So apparently he, he insisted that Obama make his academic records public. <laughs> and he's like, I heard he was I heard he was a terrible student, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> uh, you know how how does a bad student go to Columbia and then Harvard? Let him show his academic records. <laughs> um, and obviously Trump you know, didn't want to show his own academic records. Uh, and yeah, college credentials have kind of been uh, sort of weaponized a little bit. Weaponized. Uh, and, 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 yeah, just like this this thing about like, are you smart or not? That this, it, Smartness is now like one of the battlefields. And obviously mm -hmm. like, Every, you know, Trump. Trump, call, you know, Trump is seen by lots of people to not be very smart, and so he, you know, he he, he he's many times tried to sort of, yeah, like people call him like a moron and stuff like that publicly, like even other other public figures, and so he he sort of has to try and insist that he's a smart person, a very stable genius, um, and you know, he said things. He's had to say things like, yeah. I'm speaking with myself, number one, because I have a very good brain and I have a lot, I've said a lot of things. My primary consultant is myself. He's, he's often asserted that he has a high IQ and that his critics have low IQs. <laughs> you know, um, he's, talk, he's talked about how his uncle had been a professor at MIT who he described as an academic genius. And that's evidence that Trump has good genes, very good genes. Um, you know, he, he, after he appointed his first cabinet, he said, you know, we have by far the highest IQ of any cabinet ever assembled. <laughs> uh, he was giving like a speech to this to the CIA shortly after his inauguration, in which he said, trust me, I'm like a smart person. Like this thing about being smart is now is now like the main thing that people kind of care about. Whereas historically, it might have been around like, you know, being virtuous, being right or something like that. It's now shifted towards uh, towards being smart yeah i'm i i'm often very uneasy by this idea of smart like anytime i see someone on twitter saying oh, oh my god twitter is amazing because you get to meet so many smart people or <laughs> i want to connect with smart people or, or just yeah just that, this, that kind know. of word just feels very uneasy yeah smart is now the sort of the the north star for what you want to be hmm Kind as of opposed thing. to morally good or virtuous or white, <laughs> for example, it's now, hey, I want to be friends with you because you're smart. Right. And yeah, like education has kind of been put, had been sort of put forward by lots of people as the, the solution to inequality. You know, Bill Clinton uh, sort of, wait just a sec, let me get the Kindle open on my, my, lap, uh, my iPad, my professional iPad, it's just run out of battery. Yeah, I have a feeling this has ended up being a long and rambly episode and that we really need written highlights to be able to make sense of a book. Yeah, this whole note-taking thing, there's got, there's got to be an efficient way of solving it. An idea that I had was that you ex exporting the audible highlights, transcribing them using Otter or Descript or something, and then cross-referencing them with like the Kindle ed edition, but it's just... It's just so much effort <laughs> and there's just nothing quite like being able to highlight something on kindle and then glance through it it's actually yeah, for, exactly. for, for, for basically all of the books that i've read on i've listened to on audible and thought this is a really good book i have then reread it on kindle while highlighting it and obviously kind of doing it more like cursorily but it's just been so helpful yeah okay so yeah i think the place where we left off was that yeah a lot of the political rhetoric has kind of been around education being the answer to inequality uh, bill clinton had a nice phrase he'd always say which was uh, what you can earn depends on what you can learn and you know in the in an era of globalization and stuff like that 
um, you know, you need to be able to essentially compete in the global market and what you can earn depends on what you can learn. Uh, Obama also kind of said very similar things. You know, he said, you know, back in the day, if you were willing to work hard, you didn't necessarily need a great education. If you'd just gone to high school, you might get a job um, that sort of allowed you to earn your wages and, you know, live an okay life. But those days are over and those days are not coming back. He said, we live in a 21st century global economy and in this economy, jobs can go anywhere and companies are looking for the best educated people wherever they live. And so, yeah, this idea of like credentialism, higher education being like the most important thing. Uh, yeah, the author says that the uh, the cred credentialist prejudice is a symptom of meritocratic hubris. Uh, and yeah, elites basically fell into the habit of looking down on people who didn't rise. And the uh, the constant call for working people to improve their condition by getting a college degree however well-intentioned eventually valorizes credentialism and undermines social recognition and esteem for those who lack the credentials and that the, the system rewards and yeah i think it all it, it really all comes down to this idea of social esteem and i think this is this is basically why i've long felt that praise is problematic um okay i think i think we should do a part two on the book discussion um next week after i've you know, gone through things in a, in a bit more of a structured way. Um, but let's, let's just talk about this praise thing. Like the reason, the reason I've long thought that praise is problematic is that I, you know, what does it mean when you praise someone? So for, uh, do you, do you praise people a lot, honey? Um, no, I don't. I, I, I often feel a bit uneasy about it and I, it's, it's sort of related to, I think, I think it's a similar sense of unease when people say, what were you most proud of uh, uh, proud of last year or oh y you must be really proud of what of, of what you've done i just like Ugh. yeah it just yes yeah, something about it feels like very wrong and i've i've never quite been able to the the only thing that the only uh thing in my head for why i don't feel proud of the things that i've done is because of the um you know, privileged deck stacked in my favor. I I was dealt a good hand, and I didn't squander squander that hand. Uh, and I just sort of played it reasonably, I think. And oh, so we don't need any feels... of this singling. No, no, like like <laughs> <laughs> it, it 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 feels like it feels like there's nothing to be proud of there. And right, equal and 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 I think to an extent, with the praising of others, uh, I am. Like, like, for example, if Sheen would get a job, be like, oh my God, you know, that's fantastic. Congratulations. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. be like, well, actually. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and, and, and so I think, I think there's something there with this unease around, around pride and praise. I've, but I've never been quite, quite able to explain it, but also, you know, to quote Neil Nanda, I've never actually thought about it for five minutes at a time. Okay. Right. So like when, you know, for example, you know, if your friend gets a new job, would you like say, oh, congratulations, well done, you know, something like that? I would say congratulations. I wouldn't say well done just because it, feel, it feels a bit more like a bit patronizing to say well done. But okay, yeah, fair, fair. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a sense for what you what you mean when you say congratulations? Or is it is it purely just like a social <laughs> etiquette thing where it would be weird if you didn't say congratulations? Like, what could that possibly mean? Okay, so yeah, there is an there is a an, an aspect of social etiquette. Another yeah, aspect ignoring the social et etiquette. Yeah. yeah, what what else could it mean? Uh, what might you be saying? What I might be saying is that this thing was com was competitive, and you competed well to get the thing. So well done for that. If someone has a baby, would you? I mean, you say congratulations. It's not particularly competitive. Lots. Of, I mean. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like... I've been trying, I've been trying for many years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's like, skinny you jeans. Get, <laughs> yeah. you, you, get what, you, you get what I'm saying, right? Like, you, you also congratulate people for stuff that isn't related to beating other people, or isn't related to competition. Um, Something nice right? has happened in your life. Congratulations. You know, happy anniversary! Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> somewhat competitive, <laughs> depending on who you ask. Uh, what else do we say? Congratulations about you got into university. Congratulations. That's a case of beating other people. You ran a marathon in a certain amount of time, whether or not you were competing with other people. Congratulations. 
So y you did something that was hard and that deserves praise. Deserves praise. Okay. Okay. Actually, maybe this is an interesting angle. I mean, presumably that I think there were some years at university for you where you like got a first or like did well in your exams versus mm -hmm. other years, right? Yep. Now in, in the years where you did well in your exams, did friends like praise you? Did they say, oh, well done, congratulations kind of thing? Yes. Like when you're all getting your results? Yep. How did that make you feel? Um, kind of good. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> why, why is that? Like what, what's going on there? Um, what's, okay, what's going on there is that... Okay, all right, I've got it. It's that, it's that it was hard. And therefore, when people acknowledge the hardness of the work, then the praise feels more, feels sweeter. Whereas, for example, congratulations on getting a million subscribers did not make me feel anything at all. Whereas congratulations for getting a first did. Wait, how come? And, uh, I, th I think because... I I think I think because on the million subscriber thing, it's like you kind of know it's happening, and you know that right, yeah yeah. Well, yeah. Whereas on the first thing, it's like it actually could go either way, and you've studied really yeah. hard for this thing, and it's an unknown until results day. Where yeah, you look there at was that screen, and you're like, oh yeah. my god, yes. So yeah. that is like a oh, you know sense of relief of like you know this works, and I think the more mm, the longer that journey, the the longer or harder that journey is, the more the praise feels good. But why does the praise from other people feel like, you know, I, I, I can understand why you'd feel good in yourself of like, you know, you worked hard for something. There's mm -hmm. this like catharsis of like, you know, this sort of yes. emotional release of like a build up and then a conclusion. Fine. That's great. Good stuff. Why? What's going on when someone else acknowledges that? Like, what? why does um, that feel good? Okay. I'm trying to think back because it was, it was a long time ago that I actually did well in an exam. <laughs> <laughs> I think like not not long since you made videos about doing well. <laughs> I think twenty fifteen was the last time I actually did well at an exam, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. the The personal feeling of of achievement was far greater than the sort of acknowledgement from friends. Okay, the acknowledgement from friends did feel a bit like, yeah, maybe I I I I think when I said it felt good, I was. Uh, conflating it with the sort of feeling of personal achievement rather than the the, the fact that other people were saying it to me when okay. so when my friend said congratulations for getting first it was it was it, it was more like a social etiquette thing we like oh thank you you know i okay, I, yeah. I wouldn't have yeah. actually kind of felt felt anything when my senior tutor said congratulations for getting a first i was like oh yeah <laughs> why is that oh because I, obviously i was seeking his approval in general and he's sort of a, a figure of authority and i was like oh you know this is nice and you know now he thinks higher of me <laughs> ah okay so yeah so this idea yeah. of someone sort of thinking higher of you this idea of like you know someone's estimation of you increasing as a result of something yes. yeah i think i think that that kind of hits at why i find praise problematic because if i'm praising someone okay fine it, there's a social etiquette aspect of it as well but if, if there is any any part of it that isn't just a social etiquette thing hmm. it feels like the implication is kind of ah i now think you know my estimation of you has now increased you know that's kind of what i'm what i'm saying and yes i don't but like we, that idea we all we all, really true we all do that anyway right like also can you put your phone aside sorry i get lots of messages you're very popular. My my estimation of you has just increased. <laughs> so you were saying I, we all do that. I got an e I got an email from a guy, or or rather, I I, I got in touch with this guy who is a um, professional magician, <laughs> and he wanted to be, be like my magic mentor in return for me being his YouTube mentor. And okay. I I I'd, I'd sort of come across his name before, and then I found out that like damn this guy has won the magic circle close-up magician of the year three years and for, for three years in a row like that is, wow, that nice. is a huge deal that makes yeah. <laughs> like that's <laughs> that's like a big big deal and yeah. and obviously that meant my estimation of him increased and i was far more likely to be like oh, okay let me take this guy uh, to take this guy seriously hell yes i want him to, to be my magic mentor and i will mentor him in whatever youtubing he wants uh to, yeah. to get to get mentorship from that sort of person 
Whereas if it had been a case of I Googled his name and I find that he's, you know, has not got any of these credentials. Yeah. Like, you know, in, in that sense, it's like, you know, <laughs> uh, but... But that's that different. That's like, like transact- that it's feels like, like the it's, plumber action. The, yeah, the, it's like the hiring a plumber. Yeah, you want, yeah. you want a good plumber. <laughs> <laughs> but, as, but as in like, my point is my, my estimation of him increased and we kind of all do that anyway. Right. Your estimation of him as a magician increased. Yes, but also my respect for him as a human oh. being probably increased as well. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> What's going on there? I've got, to, I've got to be honest, man. Look, if you don't know someone... No, I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate the honesty. If you, if you don't know someone, uh, you know, then credentials, like in, in particular credentials that you know are sort of like mean something, is a reasonable way of, is a reasonable proxy for, you know, how, how seriously should I take this person? It's not ideal. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and it, I, I'm, I, can, I can get on board with that in mm. when it's domain specific. Like if if someone's, you know, a really good magician and <laughs> I'm having a children's party. <laughs> I, <you know. laughs> I'm kidding. I respect magic as a craft. I, I genuinely do. I'm a big fan of magic. <laughs> that was just a joke. Uh, <laughs> I am <laughs> a huge fan of magic. <laughs> they're not tricks they're illusions michael <laughs> that's a arrested development reference i uh, used that but... reference i I've, I've used that reference a few times in the last couple of a couple of weeks and like only one person has ever got it <laughs> really who do yeah. i know them? Who, who got it uh i think i think i think it was molly molly i think was watches the arrested development oh, okay and i think nice. she got it yeah but anyway yeah you were saying uh children's party <laughs> yeah look i think it's fine if someone's a good magician for your for you to think they're a good magician <laughs> right <laughs> But for example, I, mean, I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast, um, but what, one of the things I really wasn't a fan of at university was that, yeah, it's sort of this idea of human top trumps, which again, we've mentioned, we've mentioned before as well of, um, you know, when I think, yeah, it was a classic thing at university when someone would introduce someone else, they'd kind of uh, sort of list, list off their achievements slash accolades yep. to try and uh, justify why this person why they were is, friends. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah why, why why they were friends or why this person is like worthy or something and be like, oh, oh oh so-and-so is my friend who is like captain of the football team and you know who came top of the year and is exam- you know whatever like it was just like such a common refrain for people to talk in that way um and i'm i'm yeah i think the, pl- the plumber thing is domain specific like if i'm hiring a plumber i want a good plumber if i'm hiring, you know if I, if I want a magic mentor then uh, I want them to be good, but I think, and and this is where the meritocracy stuff comes in as well. I think it's a very it's a very small step from that to like, ah, this this person has this credential, therefore they are a better person, therefore they are you know worthy of more respect and more social esteem and all this kind of stuff. It's like a very small step, and this is this is the issue with meritocracy, is that we don't seem to be able to separate the two things anymore. You know, it's like the higher education thing. Like that's now, yeah. Like you kind of get more, you, you sort of you get more respect as a human being because of this like random thing. And that's and that's the issue, right? And that's that's not good. And I feel yeah. like praise kind of, you know, if someone okay again outside of social etiquette, if someone is like praising you for something, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they would they could possibly mean apart from my estimation of you has now increased. And... I mean, they could, they could be praising you in a domain-specific fashion, like congratulations for winning Best Plumber of the Year. Sorry? They could be praising you in a domain-specific fashion, like congratulations, you won Best Plumber of the Year or Best Realtor 2019 or whatever. Uh, yeah, but what does the praise mean? Like, I really don't understand what it means. And look, I... I I think it's it's worth saying that with a lot of like language and communication and stuff like that, you know, like what does hello mean, right? Like, pe- you know, a, a lot of this stuff, you know, is not stuff that you can easily articulate. Like, what does it mean? And you know, to to an extent, you know, praising someone, you know, it, for example, if if your friend just opened their exam results and they did well, 
well, I guess, yeah, I guess if they did well, then you might kind of, you know, saying congratulations, it, it sort of lets you sort of elongate that moment with them and kind of let them, lets them sort of, I don't know. Do you... Let them bask in the glory a bit longer. Bask in the glory a bit longer. Yeah. I mean, so once, so when we were talking about this stuff in the Dominican Republic, one thing which we arrived at was that some things are group activities. Oh, sorry. I think group projects was, was, was a term. Some things are group projects and in a group project, it's, it's justifiable to praise someone. For example, if someone like cooks you dinner or something, you know, they're cook, they're cooking you dinner for you. Like they want you to enjoy the dinner, right? Like it's, uh, your estimation of the dinner is kind of important. And so for you mm. to then, for you to praise the cooking, uh, and praise the meal, uh, is, is different. And like, yeah, if you work in a company or whatever, and an employee is doing a good job or something, praising them for that is like, it's this group project. Like you're all there to kind of get better. You're all there to, um, you know, to do better together. Right. And so in the context of group projects, I think praise is justifiable. But something like it's, an ex exam results, it's, it's not it's, a group it's, project. Is having a baby a group project? Sorry? Is having a baby a group project? It depends what you're into. <laughs> 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 um, but like, yeah, do you get what I mean? Yes. I mean, uh, my, my initial thought was that company employee example is not so different from students together in the same college studying studying a subject and in this really? experience together and so therefore when one member of the group does well it's like oh congratulations like this is this is awesome or if for example the senior tutor were to praise you that's like the boss praising the employee in a way <laughs> for doing a good job on Maybe. the on the test that everyone is is measured against Hmm. I don't know. Like the exam thing seems a lot, a lot less group projecty. Yeah, sure. You're all kind of doing your own different exams in the same geographical space or whatever in the same community. But like, what? Yeah. So I, I think it's ju it's justifiable if if what you mean by congratulations is I'm happy that you're happy. And we've talked about this relating to pride. I think it's fine to fine to tell someone that you're happy that they're happy. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like that that is usually what we what, what we mean by congratulations. It's I'm happy that you're happy and I know that this was hard for you and there, and you did it. Like no one's going to be congratulate this oh, hang on. This is this might be partly why, you know, congratulations for just taking part is often like um thrown under the bus as being like, you know, a thing that we shouldn't do and hey, you know, they're awarding participation certificates now kind yeah. of vibe that just because you showed up that is an act worthy of praise uh that that phenomenon and the backlash against that phenomenon i think relates to this meritocracy thing that you should you are only deserving of praise if you win something in the competition as opposed to if you just show up mm. but i think i think these are two separate things i think sort of congratulating someone there's so much entangled up in entangled in that and it's not itself problematic. The thing that's problematic is potentially problematic is if your if your estimation of that person as a human being increases. Yeah, with their achievements, and it it sort of does for a lot of us. I, like I don't I don't know anyone for whom that that's not that's not the case. And I agree. Like the whole if you were a if you were in, I don't know, spiritual nirvana or whatever, and you would treat every human being as 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 equal, et cetera, et cetera, then you wouldn't be doing that. But it feels like kind of an ideal to aspire to rather than a, yeah. It's kind of like the Stoic sage is, is an ideal to aspire to where nothing affects your tranquility and you're just sort of serene and zen and living through the world in sage mode. Whereas in reality, you know, you can have that as like, okay, in an ideal world, I wouldn't think any higher of this person because they went to Harvard, but... In reality, I do kind of think slightly higher of them once I found out that they went to Harvard. I don't know. I think like <clears throat> it's obviously an ideal to aspire to, but I think like it's a lot. It's a lot more. Yeah, it, it's a lot 
closer <laughs> than achieving nirvana of being in a state of like spiritual zen all the time like because i don't think it's actually that hmm. i don't i don't think it's that unachievable and i think like yeah i like i really don't think it's that unachievable i think it, t- it, t- it takes some like first just some like thinking about the issue and then kind of noticing when you do it hmm. and yeah like for, for example i've you know again this is not me trying to virtue signal that i'm not trying to like blow my own trumpet here but i think over the past few years i've like made a very deliberate effort to try and get this mindset out of me i think like honestly i don't think i really do it anymore like i and i don't think it's that hard to, to like undo it mm, i'm suspicious really yeah, I think you're BSing yourself here. How so? I think okay. I think probably, probably the way you you are thinking of it is if you're having a chat with someone related to causal, or if you're talking at a party with with with, with a friend, you wouldn't really care how much money they've raised for their startup or at what university they went to, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because you're like you know have made it a thing a thing not to care about that. But if, for example, you were sitting on a train and someone who looked who looked homeless came and sat next to you, you'd be a lot less likely to talk to them than, for example, if you were sitting on the train and someone that you felt was either more attractive or was wearing something to signal that they, for example, went to Oxford or, or you know, something like that would make you more likely to talk to that person. And you might say, oh, well, it's, you know, we, we're likely to have more commonalities. But I think the underlying incentive the 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 underlying intention there is that you do see these people as being different on the surface and therefore you're more likely to give one your time and not the other like if you give money to a homeless man on the street you are not going to sit down and have a chat with him which is sort of what you would do if this was if you were actually in this mode of not not uh you know credentializing people i think do correct me if i'm wrong I don't know. I don't. I don't think that's that convincing. Like the like sitting the sitting on the train thing. I feel like whether you strike up a conversation with someone in in like a public space, it depends completely just on like, uh, on like the context. For for example, like the last time I had a you know a few months ago, I was on a train. I'd just gotten like my like scuba diving certificate or something. And I was like talking to a friend about that with me on the train. And then it turned out the lady opposite us was just like, a, you know, has been doing scuba diving for a few decades or something. And like she overheard the conversation and we had a discussion about that. Like, I don't think there was any greater respect that I gave her or that she gave me. It was it was simply a, a, a fact of like, oh, there is this thing that we have in common that we can talk about. Okay. Like, I, I, I think those kinds of interactions you know really are that simple okay you know like and then the homeless person thing mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's... yeah I, f- I feel like i you know i'd have as much of a chat with the homeless person as i would with any other random stranger who i might have interact with which is like oh hey you know have a good evening or like how's your evening going you know kind of thing like just i i I don't know i i I don't i think what you're saying is true that like yes i'm more likely to strike up conversation with someone who obviously has you know something in common with me that we can talk about um but I, i don't think that that's what the respect stuff really gets at okay let me let me rephrase this so okay look you might you might be right that i'm just um i'm just bullshitting myself but yeah go on okay so let's say let me tell you actually let let me tell you why i feel like it's not that difficult Mm -hmm. i feel like it's not that difficult because if you actually look at you know the data points in your life of you know people who you get on with and you know you're friends with and stuff like that i think it's completely uncorrelated with credentials sure and so 
it it also just doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's completely uncorrelated with, with, with credentials. Like you probably aren't friends with people who didn't go to university. That's true. But like, okay. so it's not completely uncorrelated with credentials. Maybe, maybe it's, it's uncorrelated with whether they got a first at university or not. <laughs> but there is, there's certainly a, a case of you are not friends with anyone who didn't go to university. Anyone really? And so you can kid yourself all you like that, yeah, sure, you're because you've reached nirvana of, of not caring what class of degree someone got. <laughs> uh, but your social circle does not reflect this uh, theoretical attitude of, hey man, <laughs> I don't care about credentials. Dude, my social circle is a function of the people who I have met in my life. And yep. obviously, you know. A lot of those people will have gone to the same university as me, for example. Yep. And be like friends of friends who also went to, the, you know, went to university and stuff like that. But again, it doesn't get at this idea of like giving someone more respect or more social esteem. I don't think it gets to that idea, dude. Okay, so let me see if I can think of an example from my life for this. So, for example. So, okay, so if we, if we go back to the starting point, our starting point is that in an ideal world, we wouldn't be giving anyone more social esteem if they, if they hold a particular accolade or achievement or credential. Yeah. Okay. So in my, in, in my, it's like, let's say someone DMs me on Instagram okay. and let's say that person has zero posts, their username has some numbers in it and they have like, they follow like four, 400 people and they DM me asking a question about X yeah, or whatever. <laughs> Let's say someone else DMs me who has a hundred thousand followers on Instagram, mm -hmm. who's got a blue tick, who, uh, you know, posts on Instagram and asks the same question. Yeah. I am far more likely to reply to one than to the other. The person with no followers, right? Of, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I believe in, um, you know, I'm a socialist at heart. Okay. And so I don't think that is a quote, bad thing. And like, uh, okay. In the, in the absence of knowing anything else about the person, the fact that someone has a hundred thousand Instagram followers automatically increases my sort of social esteem of them. If we if if we're going to use that word social esteem, and I am more likely to reply to them because I think okay, this the, you know this person is 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 in the arena, as it were. What do you mean by in the arena? Just like more likely to be cool, or more likely to benefit you in some way, or yeah, both more likely to be cool and more likely to benefit me in some way, and we're more likely to get on, and I can probably get something from them, and uh, you know, I feel I, I feel like. I don't know if this is just the case for me. I feel it's a case for almost everyone. In a lot of the friendships that we have, it is it is a case of okay, you know, the selfish part of me, the elephant in the brain, wants to be friends with this person because I feel like being friends with this person will be useful for me further down the line, as opposed to just because, you know, we get on and stuff. And yeah, sure, we we get on and stuff is 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 obviously a a requirement to to be friends with someone. But if we get on and stuff, and also they have these credentials, which I think might be useful to be a collaborator further down the line as opposed to we get on and stuff and they live across the other side of the world and they're like, I don't know, have, 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 have no credentials that I can actively make use of. I'm far more likely to be friends with the person who, whose credentials I can make use of. And in a way that probably means I hold that person in, in higher social esteem than someone okay, who doesn't have set, set, set credentials. And I think we all do this and maybe it's not ideal but i don't think there's really a getting around it given that is that me or... given that uh we that yeah there's no way of getting around it given that we don't have other information about these people and we therefore need to make snap judgments about people to decide where where, where we should be investing our time and energy yeah i think that's reasonable and yeah i, I think i definitely do that too like Yeah, I think everyone does that. Like, you know, if you get a a cold email or a DM from someone who, you know, someone who you like 
have heard of before or someone with a bunch of mutuals or yeah someone who looks to be you know doing similar things and so you might be able to collaborate in some way mm. i think i think that's fine i again i don't think that i think it's possible to do that and not hold the other person in higher social esteem but I think yeah, I might I think, be in a yeah, danger it, here of just like reducing the definition of social esteem basically down to nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think that's a, that's a problem here because you, you know <laughs> the elephant in the brain part of me wants to is very tempted to say that th this is what social esteem means to think that I'm more likely to get on with this person to think this but I'm more likely to get something from this person to think I'm more likely to benefit this person in some or, or, or possibly not to mean that we're more, we're, we're more likely going to be able to connect on a more even playing field then for example you know again in the absence of any other information someone who has no instagram followers and does not post on the internet relative to someone with 100,000 of them who post regularly on the internet like isn't that what social esteem is for some of us yeah i think a lot of what's being talked about here is like try, you know having a preference for people who you know you have stuff in common with right sure like that that's it's it seems like that's that's a lot of what's going on and that seems fine to me like it's it seems like the thing about you replying to the person with a hundred thousand instagram followers is more about you know picking you know choosing to take a shot on people who you have more in common with right uh yes which some might say is what social esteem is. Oh, okay, so if, 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 if we take the I have something in common with them, let's say we have someone who plays World of Warcraft for 18 hours a day and is, you know, uh, you, you, you know still effectively a noob versus someone who plays World of Warcraft 18 hours a day and is rank one in the, in the UK. Okay. <laughs> I would be tempted to give one of those people more social esteem than the other. So how would that manifest itself? It would manifest itself in that if I found out that someone's hobby was playing World of Warcraft 18 hours a day, I'd be interested to see what their quote like what their credentials are. From. How good they are. You want to size them up basically. I want to size them up. Yeah, I want to right click them. I want to click inspect. I want to see if they have a legendary staff. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> You know, if they've got an epic wand, that would be nice as well. <laughs> Why do you want to size them up? Because... Because the credentials are interesting. Like... Are they? Like, if someone is... Uh, if someone is rank one in the UK versus someone is, 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 is unranked, <laughs> that's... That's, that's, that's kind of interesting. I'm more likely to want to get to know the person who's ranked one in the UK than the person who is unranked. Okay, why is that? Because I hold them in higher social esteem. Because the, the again, yeah, ranked one in the UK is, is difficult, like, and there's yeah somehow better people better as a person, <laughs> right? Not so much better it's as a basically person. just some kind of moral judgment based on this thing, right? I, it's I, I don't think it's a moral judgment. I think it's more that this is someone who I would you, you know again. In the, in the absence of other information, this is someone who will be more interesting to speak to because they have achieved this credential relative to someone who has not. More interesting to speak to about World of Warcraft. Sure. Potentially. Potentially, yeah. But also about like general like performance and productivity and uh, competition and uh, high stress situations. And, you know, there's more that goes into being being a number one pro gamer than just being good at the game. I see. Is that social esteem? Yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> what? Okay, a question for you is like, if one has reached the state of nirvana whereby you don't give people a higher social esteem based on credentials, what would that look like in practice? What behaviors would you be doing that would would be a marker that hey this is my internal thought process 
And by that, I mean, for example, it's very easy to say I value my health and really take my physical health seriously. But if you look out of shape, chances are you probably don't take your physical health very seriously and you're not walking the, you're not walking the walk, <laughs> as it were. And so for you to say that you don't increase your social esteem based on credentials, what would that like if, if that were true, what would it look like in practice? Yeah, I think maybe one one tangible difference is that I really don't like this idea of trying to size someone up. And I think it's really obvious when someone's trying to do it to you. I think like, mm. you know, when you sort of, you know, if you're in this sort of startup sphere, there are various things that people will try and do to sort of size you up. Like, you know, if you tell someone, oh, you know, sort of run this company or whatever, you know, they'll their next question will typically be to try and size you up. It'll be like, yeah. oh, cool. Like, uh, how big are you guys? Oh, oh like, how much did you raise? You know, who did you raise? Who did you raise money from? You know, stuff like this, like very transparently sizing up kind of questions. Mm -hmm. And I really don't like that. And the, t and probably the tangible, yeah, the tangible difference of um, not actually holding people in higher social esteem because of things like this is that i genuinely i look again i i don't want this to come across as like virtue signaling or me blowing my own trumpet here but i actually don't make any effort to size anyone up okay so and I, one... if anything i make i make an active effort to to, not do that. <laughs> to, 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 to show that i uh, sort of to, don't don't actually signal care about that, that you don't care about how much money they've raised yeah, like I feel like if you know if I if I'm interacting with someone, there's no sizing up going on. I'm not making any attempt to size them up. You know, okay. I might I might occasionally in my head you know be curious about <laughs> you know sizing them up, but like I think that's bad. Okay, something. I, okay, I so why would okay because that's fine. So you so you're making so if you and I were having a conversation, I would say, oh yeah, I'm working on my own startup, and you'd be like, you, you know, rather than hey so have you have you raised money your your next question might be oh wh what are you working on which is a yeah. non <laughs> sizey up type question but if yeah. later on you found out or we exchanged twitter thingies and you found out that i was being followed by you know 100 people that you follow on twitter and like paul graham and like the, these people and i had like i don't know 50,000 followers or, or maybe not because that's a, a negative thingy for you but you, you, you know if, if you found out about some credentials and you realized that oh my god this is actually like a $500 million valuation company. Are you honestly saying it wouldn't increase your kind of social esteem of me relative to if, for example, when I said I'm working on a startup, it was, I've just learned how to code and I'm trying to build a t-shirt company. Hmm. I think it would. And I think, yeah, it's, it's very good and admirable and virtue, virtuous of you to not, to actively not seek out those questions. But if you were to find out that information and the fact that in your head you are you are intrigued, like it is a different, you, we all want to put people in boxes and it's a very different box when someone is founder of a billion dollar company than if someone is founder of their, I don't know, Ali Abdal Limited that's just learned how to use Python and on, on brilliant.org slash not overthinking uh, and has gone on Skillshare to learn how to set up a business. It's, it, it is a different kettle of fish. Yeah, of course it's a different kettle of fish. And like, you're more likely to want to be friends with the the big guy than the little guy. And I think internally, it is going to increase your social. It's going to be like, oh, interesting. If you find out about their 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 credentials, it would not be a completely neutral. Like, would not affect your respect for them. In the yeah, yeah, of course. It would like the reaction wouldn't be completely neutral. I'm just trying mm. to like. I'm just trying to think like, would would my would my judgment of them be domain specific or would it actually creep into like, I'd rather be friends with this person. But I think it's, it's, it's difficult to disentangle those, right? Given that you're in the startup industry and therefore it, it you know, <laughs> you are more likely to get on with someone who has been in, been in it for a while. You're more likely to want to be friends with people that, you know, if you're being honest with yourself can give you something further down the line. If you met someone who was the founder of a hundred person plus company and he was the finance guy, you could be like, hell yes, I want to be friends Mate, with you. Mate, we're going to be best friends. <laughs> yeah. I'll take you out to He's lunch. He's coming over for to dinner. dinner tomorrow. <laughs>
<laughs> you know. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Look, I agree. I think I would. I would be more likely to like want to be friends with them or whatever. But I think that comes from like the transactional. It, it comes from sort of. It comes from a transactional element rather than comes from a me actually respecting them more as a person element. What is what does respecting them more as a person even mean then? Like where uh, where all of these things are somewhat. I don't know, and I don't know if it's just me where I'm like more happy to admit that yes, I would respect you more as a, as a, as a person if you won big accolades, which which I knew I knew were difficult versus if you didn't, or if you were too, but you're just sort of using a different definition of respect as a person yeah it's tricky because it's like i think it's a hard, it's a hard thing to articulate and a lot of it is mostly intangible but i think the intangible stuff does add up you know like more likely to make an effort to keep in touch with them mm, okay more likely to invite them to something. Mm, okay. More likely to make an effort to follow up with them. Mm, more likely to follow them back on Instagram. Mm. All of these things are instrumental and transactional to an extent. But the sum of all those things, someone looking on the outside might well say that you probably respect this person more than you respect that person based on your behavior around them. Yeah, look, I think, I think this, this idea of like, respecting a person it's outside of this realm of transactional benefits that you might get from them okay like i think that there is something outside of that realm okay and you know i i think i think what you're saying is is perfectly fair and true it's only true of me that you know i might you know i might make sort of if there if there are clear transactional benefits to be gained from you know being friends with someone or collaborating with them or whatever i would probably be more likely to make an effort there all else being equal than if there okay. were you know no transactional benefits to be gained from it but i think the idea of respect comes from something else like for example like going back to the book Like, for example, why, why do you think, um, you know, if you're someone who lives in a quote unquote flyover state and hasn't gone to university mm -hmm. and, you know, hasn't done any of the things that the, uh, the elites think are worthy and good things, like why, why might you feel like society looks down upon you i think i think there are i mean yeah i guess i don't read really it maybe it's not in your it's not useful to try and try and go down that route but like yeah i mean i think in that case there is there's like a bunch of tangible stuff right like yeah um, but I think, I think the problem here is that it's very easy to say that I, I respect every human being equally, but when it comes to our behavior, it's obviously not true that we treat every human being equally. And so, yeah, it's like a thought process versus a sort of see a, a set of actions and for example if john at stripe.com were to email you versus if john 84 at hotmail.co.uk were to email you it, you know <laughs> you would have a very different response internally to those and it would affect your external behavior and then what's the difference between you saying all else being equal you respect someone with the email john at stripe.com far more than you respect someone with john 84 at hotmail.co.uk and that's mm. the place where i where i have difficulty because unless we can find a, a, a unless you can find a behavioral correlate with the thought process it's i i'm not sure you can make the 
I'm not sure it's okay. Yeah, like, yeah. I would be uncomfortable for me for, to to say that I I treat and respect every human being equally. And if anyone hears that line and wants to email us, be like, oh my god, Ali's the worst thing ever. Like, please, I would love for you to point to a way in which, if you genuinely think you treat and respect every human being equally, in what in what way is your behavior, um, in what way is your behavior uh, matching matching that thought process? Yeah, look, I think that's a fair point. To be clear, I'm not I'm not saying that I you know, treat and respect every human being. I'm saying I'm trying to say that it's actually a lot more within reach than the spiritual nirvana that we've talked about in other realms. Um, okay, sure. But yeah, I agree. Like that, you know, I should be able to point to something some concrete behavioral difference. Yeah, I think I think it's good that you I think it's good that you um, actively make an effort to, to to seem as if you're not sizing people up, but I think your internal thought process also really wants to size them up. <laughs> hmm. And it's sort of like you really want to know what someone does for a living, but when you're actively trying to play that game where you're not being the first person to ask, so what do you do? Yeah. You yeah, you're you're playing a game there. You're actually not being authentic. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Why don't you turn around so I can plunge it in harder? <laughs> um Look, look, I definitely feel like the Yeah, there, there are definitely instances where I feel the urge to you know, a curiosity about like sizing someone up. Mm. For sure. But I think those have decreased with the active effort. Okay. Yeah. And right. like none of these things happen like overnight. Like one day you don't respect everyone equally, the next day you respect <laughs> everyone equally, and you don't even have the so urge that's... to like try and solve them. Right. Like there's a transition, and and certainly in myself, like again, I th I think it's probably le it's yeah. I think in myself, I have definitely felt the urge decrease significantly through active effort over just you know three to four years and so the point yeah the point i'm trying to make is that it i felt the urge decrease like fine okay. maybe maybe this my you know maybe externally my actions are, are broadly the same maybe externally my actions are sometimes inauthentic because i'm really curious um you know what someone does for a living but i you know make an effort not to ask them but certainly internally i don't feel the urge as much and i think that's i think that's meaningful i think that is I think that's a difference like for example yeah. wouldn't you agree that if if you internally stopped feeling the urge you might you might be able to more confidently say that i sort of respect people more equally now like if you didn't feel the urge as much yeah sure i guess kind of my my original point which is is that it's not like you read i don't know happy by Darren Brown and suddenly you become a stoic sage. It's like you have the stoic sage as your ideal, the sort of person who respects everyone equally. And you're just sort of over time, you try and bring your actions generally in line with that. And yeah, that's fine. Sure. Yeah, it's a work in progress. I think we're, we're, we're all agreed on that front. But I'd like to reiterate that this is, this is like a much more <laughs> achievable work in progress over a short time frame, like a few years. Whereas the stoic sage thing is like, a life you know it seems like a lifelong quest which i mean i, I think it's i think it's also I, I don't know i think it is also a lifelong quest to actually get to the point where you do treat and value every human being equally and sure you can certainly make take take steps towards it but okay okay I'll, I think I'll, let me put it this way i think yeah. i've made a lot more progress in this era than the general lifelong quest of enlightenment <laughs> i think this is an easier <laughs> an easier thing to do than the general quest oh i'm not saying i'm 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 not saying the Stoic, Stoic Sage is particularly enlightened. I'm saying you know there there are definitely there is definitely progress that can be made towards this ideal goal of uh, being in a general state of tranquility and not letting your and not letting external factors influence your emotions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And certainly, people have made I've I've made a lot, a lot of progress in that regard over the last three or four years. But I still view it as like you know if I could actually get to that point where nothing were to affect my tranquility, that would be the yeah. lifelong quest. Equally, I strongly believe that you know the there is there is this uh 
steep learning curve and then you get diminishing returns like you've probably made more headway than i have by actively thinking about this in terms of valuing and treating human beings differently but the end point of that is my is like the lifelong quest where you where that is yeah, what yeah. You're actually doing that's what i'm saying yeah, I'm yeah not, like, i think yeah. i think we're in agreement yeah yeah great we've been going for one hour 54 minutes now it's a long time i think we should uh <laughs> yeah let's wrap things tie, up wrap things up yeah so let's read out a review also on the reviews front one thing oh, yeah. that i don't like is when people get, leave a one-star review on the basis of a single episode they're like i've been listening to your <laughs> podcast for the last 200 episodes but this episode in particular i couldn't i could not i could not listen to it for more than 20 minutes because of your rampant misogyny therefore i'm going to give the whole podcast a one-star review that seems a bit snaky i don't know like why don't you have a four-star review like if you if you've actually enjoyed the last 200 episodes and we've made some missteps what you know once twice I, f I feel like that's not really worthy of a one-star review, but hey, you know, call me old-fashioned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that's a little harsh. Um, all right, look, there's there's a bunch of interesting reviews over the past uh, couple of, well, yeah, the past week or so. Uh, okay, the, the first is actually kind of done what nice you've one. done. Okay. A nice one. Fine. Oh, oh okay. that's fine. Oh, but yeah, whatever. It's, okay. it's juicier to read out there. Look, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll read out some bad ones and then a nice one because I think that okay. the bad ones are related to the misogyny stuff, and I think it's interesting to okay. address those. Sure. So this is a this is a review entitled "Um." It's a, it's a four star review. So they they've done I think what you, oh, thank you would want them to do, which is they enjoy the podcast. They thought this episode was really bad, and so they've given it a four star review, uh, okay. which is fair play. That's that's uh, reasonable. So, thank you, thank you for that. This is from someone whose username is "Protect the NHS Save Lives" in, in Great Britain. <laughs> Uh, okay. So they said, been, lis been listening since the first episode, and I love this podcast. It's added real value to my life. But your last episode, yikes. The guest came on to hold you both accountable for how you come off as misogynistic, in brackets, which you do. Yet you both ganged up on her, and as a guest, it's quite difficult to hold your own in that situation. You should have had two female guests to balance it out. I don't think you two have ever interrupted a male guest this much. Um, yeah, I think... I think the ganging up is a fair point. I think we should have mm. like foreseen that that's what the dynamic might have been. And yeah, I think that's like a, a bad situation uh, all around. And I think we should have, we should have probably thought about it a bit more that like that's yeah. probably what's going to happen. Yeah. I think given, so, uh, so I was, I was talking to Sheen about this and she, f she said that she didn't feel ganged up on during the podcast because she knows us both very well. And it's like right. sort of just having, having a chat with friends, but, it would have appeared externally to to to, uh, to, to it, it would have appeared externally as if we were ganging up on her right yeah um think, but on that note about, yeah go on on that note we we're, we're definitely planning an episode where we have two female guests to talk about similar topics <laughs> yeah this person also mentioned that they don't think we've interrupted a male guest this much hmm I'm I'm honestly not sure where this interrupting interrupting thing comes from. I feel I like we certainly inter interrupt each other. We do you know, fairly fairly regularly. Fair I guess male guests we've had Mac on a few times. I, yeah, I can't remember to be honest. Maybe it's true. Yeah, I'm yeah, not sure. It's true. But I feel like uh, the, I feel I feel like the male guests we've had on haven't made points that we substantially disagree with, and therefore. You know, for example, if if you were to say something that I blatantly disagreed with, I would be like, "Oh, hold on, hold on. What's your definition of X?" Just yeah, to make yeah, sure yeah. we're on the we're on the right page, right, right. Which yeah. would be seen as interrupting. Whereas, you know, we wouldn't have needed to do that with Mac, given the sorts of things we were discussing. But okay, fair point. Something worth keeping in mind. Yeah, I'll bear that bear that in mind. We then had a one star review about episodes eighty nine and ninety. Oh, uh, so the, okay. the two most recent episodes. Uh, I won't read that out. I think it's a bit rude. Uh, to us or to our guests? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not read it out. Uh, and then, yeah, maybe we can end on a good one. So this is a review entitled Love the Two Brothers. It's a five-star review from uh, Chi Le Vu in Australia. Uh, they say, seriously, these guys seem like the most real and down-to-earth men there are. Uh, their banter and sometimes very philosophical debate on the human condition are not only food for thought, but also pretty assuring for me, as I feel like I'm not the only one that is overthinking. Um, also, <laughs> this is pretty pretty good. Also, the two guys are husband material, speaking as a girl. Would totally marry either of them. 
since they demonstrate themselves to be upstanding, thoughtful young men. Tamor is a babe, though, and then a blushing face. Oh, that's a nice, nice. review. That's a nice review. Yeah. Apart from the last we bit. Could, <laughs> we, could do, we could do with more reviews like that. Oh, that wouldn't hurt. <laughs> but no, thanks, thanks for the reviews, good and bad. Um, yeah, I'll think about the interrupting stuff. And yeah, we will uh, address the misogyny uh, topic again with uh, more balance with two two female guests at some point in the next few weeks probably mm. yeah and thank you thank you to everyone who's been, because like in that in the in that review uh i think you said or whoever the, the reviewer said addressing the top coming across as misogynistic which you do it's that which mm. you do bit which is which is very interesting like uh, it's it's the sort of thing we don't intend to do and therefore if you can like if you email us or tweet us and you can point to specific examples where we have done it then that will kind of help us be like oh, okay we shouldn't we shouldn't do that but just a general vibe of you guys come across as misogynistic is very difficult to actually action and given that we don't want to come across as misogynistic and and yes you could argue it's not your job to educate us and bloody blah, blah like okay fine but if you would like to <laughs> then you're more than welcome to email us with with examples and we'll yeah do our best not to come across as misogynistic i feel like part of it has got to be like the va- the sort of vaguely sexual jokes or like <laughs> laughing at things like that that's got to be part of it well so if if, if i said i don't know like a, a, a warlock with a legendary staff yeah that that comes across the i mean if if, if that's the case like I would, laugh, i'd, I'd love know, to hear it yeah jo- i think like like making any kind of be- sexual joke and then kind of chuckling at it is that misogynistic i think it might come across that way okay because we've also had a lot of emails from people being like i don't know how anyone has ever read has has read this this type of thing as being misogynistic yeah yeah so like (laughs) you know yeah i don't know man it's tricky a work in progress a lifelong quest a lifelong quest for enlightenment and to yeah yeah all right we will uh we'll leave things there Thank you for listening to this long episode. We'll do a hopefully more structured part two where we probably um, sort of dig into and summarize the tyranny of merit next week. Uh, Hope you have a great week. Bye-bye. See you later. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on the Apple Podcasts website if you're not using an iPhone. There's a link in the show notes. If you've got any thoughts on this episode or any ideas for new podcast topics, we'd love to get an audio message from you with your conundrum, question, or just anything that we could discuss. Yeah, if you're up for having your voice played on the podcast and your question being the springboard for our discussion, email us an audio file mp3 or voice note to hi at notoverthinking.com. If you've got thoughts but you'd rather not have your voice played publicly, that's fine as well. Tweet or or DM us at N Overthinking on Twitter, please.